to be talking about muscles and how they work. And there's somebody with a bunch of muscles, isn't he? Actually, no more muscles than you or I have, just way bigger ones. Okay, muscles are made out of, in general, two parts. There's the elastic component, uh, which is connective tissue. Uh, we'll talk more about that. Uh, plus the contractile component, uh, which is actin and myosin and those fibrous proteins which hold them together. The muscles are within fascial sheaths, and those fascial sheaths are further within compartments. We talked about compartments in anatomy. Each muscle is surrounded by a connective tissue envelope called an epimesium. Uh, as we look a little bit more deeply, there are subdivisions of muscle fibers within a muscle, uh, which are called fascicles, and the muscle fascicles are surrounded by a connective tissue envelope called a paramecium, as we see uh, outlined in the blue over here on the uh, photo on the lower right. Uh, the photo on the lower left is a little bit more uh, of an advanced micrograph. We're looking with a little bit more magnification uh, at the connective tissue envelope of each muscle fiber. And the connective tissue envelope uh, that surrounds each muscle fiber is called an endomesium. Uh, that is not to include the uh, muscle membrane itself, which is called the sarcolemma and is electrically active. We'll talk about that over the next few minutes. Here we see a drawing uh, that are showing those subdivisions. So the largest unit in the drawing is the muscle proper. Within the muscle are the subdivisions uh, of muscle fibers called fascicles, as we described. And the muscle fibers are very, very long uh, cells. They're very big so far as cells go. In fact, in uh, the case of uh, fusiform or strap-shaped muscles, they travel the whole length of the muscle, uh, so they're very long. Uh, but within the muscle fibers are uh, myofibrils, and within the myofibrils are myofilaments. Myofilaments are those fibrous proteins which you've studied about before, the actin and myosin, uh, that uh, do the cross-bridging and actually uh, cause the muscle to contract. All right, we're going to spend the next few minutes discussing the microanatomy within the muscle fiber. Uh, first, the proteins, uh, myofilaments, include actin uh, and not troponin. Troponin is actually a globular protein rather than a fibrous protein, but tropomyosin is indeed uh, a fibrous protein, usually not considered a myofilament, though. The myofilaments are actin and myosin. These are things that you've heard of before. And titan, uh, titan, T-I-T-I-N, uh, -I -I uh, is a elastic protein that holds the myosin myofilaments to the Z-disc so that the sarcomere cannot separate completely. Here's a drawing of the sarcomere that you can see. So the sarcomere is considered the uh, length from Z-disc to Z-disc. The Z-discs hold the actin myofilaments uh, in place with the myosin myofilaments held between them. And here is an actual uh, electromicrograph of sarcomeres uh, in real muscle tissue. This is a more detailed drawing of the myofilaments. Uh, the myosin uh, myofilament is the bigger of the myofilaments with the myosin head groups that actually move uh, and create the muscle contraction. Uh, the actin uh, myofilament uh, at rest has tropomyosin, uh, which is hiding the binding the site from the myosin head so that they are not 
bound electrostatically. Let's talk a little bit about the microanatomy within the muscle fiber. Uh, in this drawing, you see really nicely portrayed uh, the myofibrils within the muscle fiber. Now, the T-tubules are how the depolarization spreads through what is this really giant cell uh, after the sarcoplasm is depolarized, uh, a process which you've thought about before in physiology as undergrad, and we'll talk about more in this lecture in addition to other uh, times through the course of the curriculum, especially in physiology. Uh, so the sarcoplasmic reticulum uh, is how calcium is spread through the uh, myofilaments, um, and calcium, when this cell is at rest, is held in the terminal cisternae. Uh, mitochondria are needed in all, almost all cells to produce ATP. As an undergrad, you probably learned about three fiber types. Uh, actually, fiber types come in a continuum, but we arbitrarily classify them into three types. But on one end of the continuum is a slow twitch, or the red oxidative. Those are the ones that cannot generate lots and lots of tension because they tend to be smaller, uh, but they tend to have also a lot of mitochondria, which gives them their color. So those are the endurance type of muscle fibers. The type 2A, the slow twitch are called type 1, the type 2A are the hybrid between oxidative and glycolytic, uh, so they're intermediate uh, between the ability of generating lots of tension and the ability of endurance. Uh, they have a moderate amount of uh, mitochondria. And the type 2B are the ones with the least amount of mitochondria, but they're also the ones with the highest amount of fiber girth. Uh, so that those are the ones that can generate by far the most tension. The functional unit of a muscle is called a motor unit consisting of the alpha motor neuron, the motor end plate, where the neurotransmitter acetylcholine is transmitted to the sarcolemma or the membrane of the muscle fiber causing depolarization and then the muscle fibers themselves. The motor units are one alpha motor neuron with all the muscle fibers that are innervated it and how many muscle fibers are innervated it really depends upon what that muscle needs to do. So for example, uh, when we have the need for very fine control, like the extraocular muscles, then there is one alpha motor neuron to very few muscle fibers. When the control is not so fine, but we have the need of massive power, such as in the gluteus maximus, uh, then one alpha motor neuron is dedicated to over a thousand muscle fibers. This diagram represents a really important principle that large alpha motor neurons with large cell bodies have large diameter axons and go to big motor units with many fibers and fibers that are also the larger, more powerful type 1A fibers. So those are able to generate lots and lots of muscle tension and provide a lot of joint torque. Small alpha motor neurons have much smaller diameter fibers and go to smaller motor units, both in number of fibers and the type of fibers that they are, tending to be the 1A fibers uh, with um, a smaller diameter and the ability to generate considerably less tension. The larger the body of the alpha motor neuron, the more input from the central nervous system is going to take to recruit. So given the same amount of input from the central nervous system, the smallest cell bodies will recruit first, and therefore the smallest motor units that generate the least amount of tension. This is really important in the conservation of the energy. It allows us to use only the amount of muscle tension that we need to use in order to achieve a particular task. Please look in detail at the diagram uh, in the illustration. One thing that's really important that you see is that uh, over all the way to the left are the 
big motor units with the fast twitch fibers, and you see, although that they can generate the most tension, they're able to sustain it for the least amount of time. Uh, and then actually, although we think of it categorically, it's actually actually a continuous variable, but going down to the uh, small motor units with type 1A fibers that cannot generate very much tension, but are able to sustain that tension for a long time. Whether or not a alpha motor neuron depolarizes is the result of the summation of the input that it receives. Uh, every alpha motor neuron uh, is receiving hundreds and hundreds of inputs from elsewhere in the nervous system, uh, some of them being facilitatory, telling it to recruit, and some of them being inhibitory, telling it not to recruit. So when the total summation of those uh, reaches a threshold, then the alpha motor neuron will recruit. Uh, the total amount of signal coming from the central nervous system uh, that helps uh, alpha motor neuron recruit is called central drive. So central drive uh, can help the number of alpha motor neurons and therefore motor units that are called into action. That's called increasing recruitment. And the other thing that can increase muscle tension uh, is increasing the rate of muscle tension. And we're going to look at that in the next slide. So what you see here uh, is a muscle being artificially stimulated. I remember as an undergrad, actually, in physiology, uh, doing this experiment with the uh, gastrocnemius of a pithed frog. Uh, and this is probably what we're actually seeing here. So what you see, though, over on the left side of this diagram uh, is a single muscle twitch. So if it's a single twitch, then you get some tension, and then the tension relaxes all the way. Uh, you get some tension, tension relaxes, uh, as such. I'm going to show you uh, with the pen. So here's tension and tension relaxing, tension, tension relaxing. Uh, but then what happens is that you're taking, uh, as the twitches become more frequent, uh, we are taking the slack out of the series elastic components. And we'll talk more about the elastic components of the muscle over the next few minutes. So as we get to the fourth twitch over here, you see that the tension is not returning to zero between each one. It's getting more and more frequent tension, not returning to zero, until finally we get a summation uh, of tension up over here. One more thing that's really important about the ideas from the previous slide that I forgot to mention is that you notice how it takes a while for the tension to maximize. Uh, and this is actually true in natural muscle recruitment as well. The generation of muscular tension is a rather slow phenomenon because it takes a little while for the muscle uh, contractile elements uh, to bring all the slack out of the series elastic components of a muscle. The shape of a muscle, the architecture of a muscle, uh, is very much tied to what that muscle is able to do for us. We talked a little bit about this in anatomy. Actually, we talked a fair bit about this in anatomy, if you remember, uh, that the muscles where the fiber direction are parallel uh, are the strap or fusiform shaped muscles. So those have many long muscle fibers and they contract over, they are able to contract over a long range of motion and have a big range of length. But because there's not a big volume of muscle fibers, uh, they're not able to generate lots and lots of tension. Uh, the pinnate muscles, which insert into a central tendon, and they can be a unipinnate, in which there's just one set of muscle fibers inserting into that uh, central tendon, or bipinnate, in which there's two sets, or multipinnate, in which there's three sets, those have many short fibers. So those are really the best uh, at generating lots of tension. So the quadriceps, for example, is an example of a multipinnate muscle, as is a deltoid. However, those muscles aren't able to contract across a long range of motion. 
some muscles spiral, although that's really not anything that determines what they're able to do for us. It's just what they need to do in order to insert where they need to. Uh, but one more thing that is really interesting is the fan shape of certain muscles. You see fan shaped muscles over joints of a certain type. The fan shaped muscles are able to provide tension across a large variety of joint angles and that's why they tend to be uh, the muscles that surround ball socket joints which are the most mobile type of, of joints that we have. Here are a couple of examples of the different types of muscle architecture we talked already about each of these in the anatomy. So the sartorius is the longest muscle in the body. The fibers are very, very long. It can provide tension over a big range of motion, uh, but it can't provide very much tension because it doesn't have very many fibers. Uh, something like the rectus femoris uh, has many short fibers, so it's a small range of motion, but is able to generate a considerable tension. As you were looking at the diagrams and illustrations in this presentation, maybe you've noticed that there's a lot of angles involved again. So hopefully you haven't thrown away your calculators after the last unit. Because we're going to need to think about some similar math uh, to be able to figure out how much tension is being transmitted to bony attachment points uh, by muscular tendons and how much tension is being transmitted uh, into central tendons in the case of pinnate muscles uh, by the muscle fibers. Uh, so we're going to have to think about this math again. We're going to do it right now, in fact. In order to calculate the tension that a muscle fiber is transmitting to a central tendon in a pinnate uh, muscle or to figure out how much tension a muscle is getting to a bony attachment, we need to use some of the trigonomic functions that we had used in the last unit. For example, uh, if we think about the diagram on the upper left, uh, if the hypotenuse is the direction and magnitude of the actual vector being pulled by the muscle fibers, uh, the amount of pull is calculated by the sine of the angle that that hypotenuse makes with a vector which is perpendicular to the tendon. Uh, if we think about how much of the total muscle tension is rotating the bone, uh, then we consider the sine again in this case uh, on the diagram on the lower uh, and the compressive force is the cosine of the hypotenuse angle. Anatomical cross-sectional area is the gross cross-sectional area uh, across a muscle. So if you transect the biceps brachii like you see on the left or the soleus, like you see on the right, the anatomical cross-sectional area are similar. However, the soleus is able to generate way more tension than the biceps brachii because of the number of fibers. So since the biceps brachii is a fusiform-shaped fiber, the cross-sectional, the anatomical cross-sectional area is the same as the physiological cross-sectional area. However, with a bipinnate muscle like the soleus, the physiological cross-sectional area is represented by the black line. So you see you have way more muscle fibers, therefore the ability to generate more tension. Mechanically, we can think of muscles having two components. A motor, which is represented by the contractual component of actin and myosin, uh, and then springs. So there's a spring uh, within the muscle, which is called the parallel uh, elastic component and the springs at either end of the muscle which are called the series elastic component. The diagram here is showing the passive tension of a muscle. So the muscle can be elongated to a certain length uh, and how long that length is depends a lot upon which muscle it is and from which individual it is. 
but it can be elongated to a certain length before there's any tension increase at all. Uh, and then once we begin to have passive tension, which is coming from those elastic components of the muscle, then the tension increases exponentially. The active tension of a muscle is a function of the number of cross bridges between the actin and myosin, as represented in this diagram on the slide. The sarcomere length, where the number of cross bridges is maximized, is about 2.2 micrometers. When the sarcomere is stretched out beyond that, uh, then there may be tension, but it's passive tension being generated by the elastic components of the muscle. Uh, when the sarcomere is shorter than 2.2 meters, then their amount of potential cross bridges also decreases. This is called active insufficiency, and the ability to generate tension also decreases. So between the active and the passive tension, we see two curves uh, of different shapes, but they overlap, such as we see in this diagram here, which shows a combination of the actively generated tension and the potential passive tension over on the right side of the diagram, where we have the maximum amount of tension, but it is being generated almost completely passively. Although we have these extremes of what is called passive insufficiency, that is that the, there are not enough cross bridges to generate active tension, or active insufficiency, that is when the sarcomeres are too short to generate tension, those are mostly experimental and don't generally happen with muscles that are on a living person or another living organism. So what you see on this diagram over on the right side of the slide uh, is that although the ability to generate active tension can change according to muscle length, it never becomes so extreme that you actually get into a huge loss of muscle tension because of either active or passive insufficiency. Uh, just a relative amount of loss of muscle tension. And these final couple of slides are just a review of the important ideas which you should remember and review when you think about the topics that we discussed today with this lecture.